Today's a uh, real special day for uh, one of our brothers and for uh, his wife as well. It's the 59th anniversary of Kirk's baptism. And it's, the, uh, it's about a week after the 26th anniversary of the wedding of uh, Kirk and Danuta. So we're gonna do a, a nuptial blessing uh, over the two of them in anticipation of the Zolna's convalidation on Saturday. So uh, we'll call them forward after the, uh, the Our Father today, but we'll also use it as a chance for uh, those of us who are married here, uh, just to ask the Lord's grace and blessing and power to once again flood your heart. So uh, congratulations to you, brother, and uh, honored to celebrate with you today. How do I not know this? As I was praying this morning, that's the question that's in my head, uh, thinking about our, our time so far together. You come to Europe, you listen to people like Alex and Olga, who just seem to drip knowledge, right? As they talk about Polish history, European history, church history, and you realize that maybe not us, our brothers and sisters back home in America, we know remarkably little. We're in extraordinarily ignorant culture. How do I not know this? How is it that we don't seem to know much about our own history Maybe we don't even care. And yet you listen to Alex and Olga and others and how fierce they are in defending and protecting and handing on their past and their culture and the significance of what it means to be Polish. Even yesterday watching the movie, I was surprised how many people, not so much hadn't seen the movie before, didn't know anything about John Paul. And we learn about this man's life, and we ask, how do I not know this? We look at Colby as we prepare to head to Auschwitz, and we see all that happened there. And we ask, how do I not know this? Today, by providence, we're in a the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima on the 99th anniversary of the sixth and final apparition of Mary in Fatima in Portugal. Some of us have been there. Others know nothing about it. It seems worth just recounting a few things about it historically so we can kind of fix ourselves and this moment and understand what it is the Lord might want to say to us. So in 1917, from May 13th until August 13th, or excuse me, October 13th, there were six apparitions of Our Lady to these three young children. It was a peasant community. These children were poorly educated. And Our Lady appeared to them over these months on these six occasions, telling them a series of things, asking them to pray. Pray much, she said. And to do penance for those who had rejected the Lord. Finally, on this day, October 13th, 1917, some 70,000 people gathered together in what is now today this huge open-air pavilion. At that time, it was a field. Most of whom were unbelievers, including the Portuguese newspapers who were fiercely anti-clerical. And so they were present. It was pouring rain, much like the last couple days have been for us. Photographers were there. Film crews were there. 
And sure enough, Our Lady was there. And she came, and she said again, to do penance, to pray much, to pray for the conversion of Russia. And she promised that the war, which was going on, World War II, was about to end. But then she warned the children and said, if in fact the world does not repent, then another war, a worse war, will come which quite honestly was unthinkable for Europe in the middle of World War I. World War I was in many ways a familial war. It was royal families fighting against each other in horrific combat. And of course, that happened. Why is it providential that we're here? Because on May 13th, 1981, the anniversary of the first apparition of the children to the, or of Our Lady to the children of Fatima, Pope John Paul II was shot. He attributed his recovery, most especially to Our Lady, and not just to Our Lady, but to Our Lady of Fatima. And so he was famously quoted as saying, one hand pulled the trigger and another hand guided the bullet the man who shot him, a Turkish man, whom John Paul went to visit in prison and forgave for trying to kill him, asked him the question, how is it that you are still alive? For the bullet was laced with poison. It went into his intestines. He should have been dead. We saw his sash yesterday in Chestahova that he wore, the belt that goes around his waist, which had his blood on it. And he was, in fact, almost dead. And so he attributed his victory and his uh, recovery uh, to her intercession. Thus, the significance of being here on this date, which was the anniversary of the final apparition of Our Lady's appearance to the children. Some rather significant events. 70,000 people witnessed this thing. Not only the apparition, they, they witnessed what was known as the miracle of the sun. So in front of all these non-believers, all of whom acknowledged what they saw, all of whom took pictures, all of whom, or some of whom, filmed it, the sun began to spin, glow, emit red flames, and then move rapidly towards the crowd, which caused a bit of a panic. It did this for a number of minutes, at which point it then withdrew, went back to its normal place, and everything was dry. Many people often say, if I only saw a miracle, I'd believe. Not true. Miracles don't convert. 70,000 people saw that. Didn't change their hearts just like the religious leaders in the gospel. They saw Jesus, they saw the miracles, the response, no conversion, because the heart has to be opened. What's this have to do with us today? Maybe it's simply this, the question, how do I not know this, comes to mind in the first reading. The first reading just simply lays out in a really short, concise form, the plan. So we don't know Polish history, we don't know World War II history, we don't know John Paul's history, but the shocking thing is countless ones of us in this world don't know human history. Why am I here? Where am I going? How do I get there? Who's this God? Many of us instead, we were talking the other night, have, for a variety of reasons, an incredibly deformed understanding of God. And Paul's talking to a pagan audience, an audience like ours, not ours, but ours, the world in which we live, huh? He's trying to help them understand, who is this God? 
How is it that things have gotten bad? And what has he done about it? And what should we do in response to what he's done about it? Who is this God? He's a father. What kind of father? Generous, kind, compassionate, merciful, good. Out of his goodness, he formed us out of nothing. Why? Because he chose us from the foundation of the world, Paul says, to belong to his family, to share in his own life. A Baptist friend of mine once used as an image of that, he says, imagine growing up in an incredibly dysfunctional family. Not hard to imagine for some of us. Where there's abuse of all sorts of kinds going on. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. It's a horrific place to live. You do everything you can not to go home after school. You get involved in every ex extracurricular activity you can find. Why? Because it's so difficult to go back home. Finally, you sneak in late every night, hoping everyone's asleep. And this goes on for years. And across the street, you can hear outside your bedroom window, is this idyllic family. And every night, as you're going to bed, hoping your door stays shut, you can hear across the street the father playing with his children. And they're laughing. And you can see him in the front yard. And they're playing catch, or he's pushing them in a swing. And you long to know what that's like. And for years, this goes on. Until one day, while no one's home but you, the father of the family across the street knocks on your door. And you answer. And he simply asks, Would you like to live with us? And you don't even pack. He has chosen us from the foundation of the world to be his adopted children, to belong to his family. Why? So he can control us and manipulate us? Nope. So he can share his life and his love and his grace and his joy and his happiness with us. That was the plan. That is the plan. How to go wrong. Ah, there's an enemy. There's somebody who's envious of that plan. Somebody who earlier than the creation of our race heard God's plan for us. And though he was created good, was so fiercely opposed to God's plan for us, our race, to share in his own life, God's own life, that he went on the attack, rejected God, left heaven. And because he can't get to God, he goes after the creature that God loves the most. That's us. And so he went about starting to sow lies. And the lies all have to do with the identity of the God who made us. He begins to cast the Father in suspicion and to whisper to us, he's not good. He's not trustworthy. He's not loving. He's not merciful. He's not compassionate. Or that wouldn't have happened to you. And so we find ourselves in a place where we don't trust. And so Our Lady, on October 13th, 19, or 1917, is clothed, you can say, with the sun. She's standing right next to it. It begins to shine all around her in this vision that the children have, which takes everybody there back to Revelation chapter 12, which describes another vision of a woman clothed with the sun, in front of whom stands a dragon. The woman's pregnant, 
and the dragon stands there ready to devour her child, but she, he can't. The child's protected. The woman is Mary. The child is Jesus. The dragon is the enemy. And so the dragon goes off to make war against the woman and the woman's child's offspring. That's the church. When John Paul came to Fatima, after he had recovered, to give thanks to Our Lady's intercession, he told everybody there, have nothing to do with the dragon. Don't flirt with sin. Don't flirt with evil. Don't flirt with wrongdoing. Why? Because the instigator hates you. That's the first and the second part of the story. The third part, which is the great part, is to muzzle the dragon. God's son comes in human flesh to do what? Paul says, to redeem us. That is, to buy us back with his blood so that you and I can have definitive proof with our eyes, regardless of how we feel, that God is good, that he's a father, that he cares, that he loves, that he's trustworthy. That's salvation history. That's it. God, good, creates human beings to dwell in friendship, be part of his family. Man and woman reject the offer. God comes, makes possible our coming back into the family. And now you and I are simply living the drama. And the question in front of us, always, right? Every day. Some of us have made a decision to follow Jesus. Others of us haven't. That's all right. I made it yesterday. So what? Got to make it again today. Now that I know this, what will I do about it? Will I trust? Will I open my heart? Will I stop waiting for a miracle? Mindful that that won't make any difference for most of us. At this and every single Mass, we are, right now, truly at the foot of the cross. That's what it means to say the Mass is a memorial. It's not a memory. It's not something I'm trying to think about. It's happening. Sacramentally speaking, you and I are really, right now, at the foot of the cross, watching Jesus pour his life back to the Father for me and for you. We are, right now, listening to him say to the Father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And every time we come to Mass, we're simply faced with a question. What are we going to do? How am I going to respond? How can it be that love, capital L, is not loved? How can it be that God is not trusted? How can it be that the world doesn't know this story? So Our Lady says to the children in Fatima, and she says to us, repent and believe. That is to say, turn away from sin and give your lives to the good God. 
Turn away from the dragon. Trust the one who's laid down his life for you. And then pray fiercely, that is to say intensely, for those who do not yet know him, that they would come to know him. Because God's desire is that all would be saved. His desire is that all of us would be saved. His desire is that all of us would come into his family. He's knocking on the door right now of that house in which we live, simply asking, do you want to be a part of my family? What will we say?